This is the story of James. When I was living in the boarding house, I had transitioned through a few different boarding houses and James lived in the Decatur boarding house. James was one of my mentors. Yes, he was living in the boarding house. Let me tell you how it went down. At one point, I started making a little bit more money and I got fancy and I moved to another house that Anthony, the guy who owned the house in the West End, he owned in Decatur. So uh, the Decatur house was smaller, therefore less roommates, and the rooms were a little nicer. So I moved out there, and one of the roommates was James. And everybody got along pretty well. It was a more of a professional guy, a crew. There was this one guy who was living there who was dating an attorney who used to come to the house. And this was, house was very different than the West End house in regards that the guys had regular jobs. They had long-term jobs. They just didn't make enough to have their own place or they went through some trials and tribulations. We all had a story to tell in there. And, and you know, James was cool. Things changed. And this is the lesson that I learned. When I was in the boarding house, I used to go get my kids and bring them to that boarding house because it was nicer. And James and I had words because I was parenting my kids. I was really strict on them. And he's like, you know, you don't need to be letting, treating them like little robots. You know, let the kids be kids. And I was like, James, shut, shut up. These are my kids. You have, this ain't none of your business. Stay out of it. And, I, you know, and then we had a little beef for a while. And then one night, James and I was in the house watching the television with a really big, nicer uh, color television. And James just started talking about the mother of his children. And he's like, you know, when you have a kid with a woman, you hope the kid doesn't look like you because that woman more than likely is going to take out her anger at you on the kid. And I, I thought for a minute, because I had never really thought about this stuff. Um, essentially, you know, I didn't think my ex-wife was doing anything hanky with the kids until much later. But, you know, we started, you know, he started to open up. And the reason that he was acting funny was he was missing his kids and he couldn't see his kids because his wife was crazy. She did not allow him to participate in their bringing. And, you know, he just started talking about some stuff. And we got cool again because, you know, we had beef. We had beef. I was like, you don't tell me how to raise my kids. That's my business, right? And, you know, when the kids were little, they were very well behaved. So I didn't think I was doing a bad job. I would think that if I had been allowed to stay in their lives, that a lot of the bad things that happened to them would have not happened. And this is one of the reasons I started this channel for men. And I've said this before, and people get upset, like, we don't need nothing for men. When very much we do need stuff for men. That's why I have all of these courses. That's why I have these things for men, because I know what the lies of a woman can do to a man's life. And it's rampant. And, you know, but back to James. So we got cool again. We, we dapped it up. And I started to learn a lot from him because James was an IT guy. And James had a pretty good job, but the reason he was living in the boarding house was child support for the kids he could not see. Because his child support was killing him because everybody in the house had a car and everybody, you know, and then it was funny. James was a big old juicy guy and he was from Bankhead. He grew up in Bankhead which is gone today. Bankhead was these um, projects that Atlanta was famous for because, you know, the Bankhead bounce. A lot of the first rappers came out of Bankhead. Uh, T.I. was Bankhead Hollywood area. So he came from over there and, you know, it, it, it was wild, right? Because it was interesting how I never brought a woman, I could never get a woman to come to that house. It was funny, but everyone else was able to. And I remember 
James had this Asian chick in his room for a few days. She was there like three, four days. And you know, he, he got super nice and super charming because he was getting some, right? It, it was funny, but I remember all of those conversations that we had because the guy that was taking the attorney, he was super religious and he met her in church. So if you're in a boarding house, church is a way to meet women because, you know, she was because, you know, uh, we used to because, you know, when people found out that she was a lawyer and they were together and it was, it was very interesting because they were together and they were having discussions. Should he move out of the boarding house into her house? And we all had that discussion and everybody was like, don't do it. Don't do it because, man, you're moving into her house. You're not moving into y'all's house. You're moving into her house. She had that house before you got there. And, you know, uh, eventually he, he did not listen to us and he moved into her house. And six weeks later, he was back. <laughs> he had never stopped paying rent on his room. It was like he kind of knew going in that there was this potential for dissent because uh, he came back and we were like, oh, we see you. He was like, man, we can't live together. It's her house. She's very super, she's very picky and everything. And it, it, it was really interesting. And then James had his two cents in because James was a hood dude that I could operate in the hood and in the regular world. You know, he could be very well spoken, like the Asian chick he got in there. She was super nice. He was, you know, giving her the D. And we used to have some of the most philosophical conversations in that house because the upgrade of that house was everybody had a job. And this is when I had a better assignment from Labor Ready. Um, but for, for, for fortunately, I couldn't stay in that house and I had to go back to the West End house because the rent was cheaper, because the rent in the Decatur house was much expensive. And the Decatur house did not have the MARTA access that the West End house. And that was one of the things I needed, because if you're trying to work two low end jobs, you know, because they, they're not gonna give you the best schedule. So you gotta catch the bus. I mean, I spent probably four to five hours of my day commuting just sitting on buses, riding Marta. And it, it was, it was, the house was nicer. The kitchen was, the kitchen was the bomb. The bathroom was remodeled. I mean, it, it was just a, a much nicer house. And it was like, when I left that house and moved back to the West End, it was such a big letdown because I, I moved back in my same room, it was open. But the things that I learned from James, I remember one day we were having this conversation and he was talking about how much fun you could have in the hood. And once again, this is when his hood side came out. You know, bankhead courts, going up by Hollywood, you holler at your girls and, and part of the dichotomy with that line of thinking is you tend to ignore the things that are really wrong with the hood. There's this thought process that the hood just happened. The hood is not a byproduct of bad decisions and some bad government policies because they tore all of those down. All of the projects over there, they, they tore them down and they built uh, high-end housing in those areas. Because I remember they were empty for a while. And he used to speak so fondly of, of being in the hood. And I remember going through that neighborhood with the Iceman. Just the craziest stuff I would see. How I able, was able to learn and identify a prostitute. Because I would be in an ice truck and I'd be sitting, right? And this girl walked by and she'd look at me and she would stare me down and she'd walk and she'd look looking 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 and i'm like why is she looking at me and it's like oh she's a prostitute this is what they do cut out abby and you know james 
these conversations because he was a really intelligent guy. He was a smart guy. He actually went to DeVry where he got his degree. He had his degree and he was up in that boarding house with me. And I remember we would have these conversations because that's what I liked about the house. We would have good conversations and the neighborhood was solid middle class. It wasn't hood. There wasn't no crack heads wilding out. It was just a better environment. Abby, shut up. And I remember we were having the conversation talking about women. And this is where I thought what he said was the craziest thing in the world. He, he's like, hey, gee, have you ever gone home and just pull a tablecloth off of the table to just see what your woman would do? And at the time, I thought he was crazy. And later on, I realized he was on to something. Because after I had transitioned from all of that and I had moved to East Point, I had a girlfriend that I did something crazy like that just to see how she acted. And it, it was a very interesting because the thing is, what the point that James was trying to get to me in his hood way was, you needed to test your woman before anything bad happened so you would know how she would respond if something bad happened. Because once again, all these guys had girls in this house and they would come over, spend the night, and I, I could never cross that journey in that house. But I was able to get chicks over to the West End house other than the Gallup organization girl. Yeah, that's the only time I got busy in the house. Because typically I went to their house. But James, he was a, a walking paradox of, of opinions and ideals because I think James, if he had not been born in the hood, he would have been a solid middle class citizen. Because the thing is, James had a drinking problem and he used to get toe up, messed up drunk. And that was another reason he was in that boarding house because uh, Due to his high child support, because he had three kids, so he was paying, I think, like $1,800 a month child support, plus medical, plus he had some daycare expenses. I mean, the majority of his check was going to child court, you know, because what was left over, he had a Camry, and he had enough money to afford his room. He had an extensive wardrobe, but that's how he was making it. And I remember when he brought that Asian chick in there, he introduced her around and she was cute. She was a nice looking girl. And it was just funny. And I was just surprised to see her the next morning because she didn't look like the type of chick that she would be up in the boarding house. But then the lawyer that was with the dude, she would actually spend the night some nights. She didn't look like the type of chick to be up in there. And the category of dudes in this house, they had fallen but they didn't go down the many levels that I went to in the West End house. Cause the West End house, we were all fallen men. We were all messed up men. We were all going through it because everybody in there had a story and it was a bad story. And it was like family had betrayed them. Uh, there was another dude in there because his situation was very much like mine. He was going through a divorce, but the Decatur house, they had managed to maintain some things they just didn't it was a money issue because I had a money issue and a socialization issue because I had fallen out of my circle you know I only had one friend that came and visited me in that boarding house and he's still my friend to this very day I had fallen so far out of society that this is what created these mental breaks this is what broke me away from my upbringing because I have a term divorce yourself. You must divorce yourself from your upbringing because that's one of the things I had to do to deal with all of the changes that were happening. I mean, I was brought up Southern Baptist, go to work, get your hair cut, go to church on Sunday. And none of that stuff was working for me in this new paradigm because one of the things you got to understand about this environments. If you have the skill sets to do well in an environment that supports you, you're going to do well. 
But if you don't have the skill sets to, uh, to, to deal with this environment, because the environment had shifted on me. And a lot of those old school values just didn't work. Didn't work with the hood chicks. It didn't work with the hood people. And another lesson I got from James, which was very interesting, was be yourself. Because I was uh, in there on the phone talking to this chick. And he's like, man, who are you on? Who are you trying to be on the phone? And I'm just like, I'm trying to get this chick over here, right? Because uh, this was a girl I worked with at LabCorp, and we remained friends. But she would not come to that house. She's like, I, I'm not coming over there. She let me come to her house, but she wasn't coming to that house. And then um, when I tried to make a move on her, she she got really finicky and I was like oh okay it's like that she said you know you're a nice guy but you know and she went with this other dude but the I think my fondest memories of that house the Decatur house was the conversations because we have deep probing conversations because the dude that was with the lawyer chick he was an electrician and I don't fully remember his story why he ended up there I knew why I ended up in that house. I knew why James ended up in the house. And then we had another young guy who he, he had all kinds of problems. And at one point, he moved his pregnant girlfriend into the house. And that just that's when I moved back to the West End because it was the environment over there was changing. And I just called up Anthony and I said, look, you know, I need to save some money. You got anything open in the West End? I remember so many things that happened because I was trying to maintain. I had my little workout uh, program in this house where I would do these push-up bars and I had my feet elevated. And I remember getting into a gym and being able to bench incline press like 335. So my little workout regimen kept me in top shape. And this was, was how, you know, because I, I saw some of the comments on that Spellman girl. And essentially, uh, Ron Wills, he has put it out time and time again. If you have a nice body, that is like 90% of the battle. Your face can be, you can be, your face can be twisted up, but you got a nice set of pecs, some muscular arms. You can get in. I'm telling you. And I had a nice body. I had the six pack. I was just a hood, living in the hood dude. And... And someone said in my past life, I was a killer because there was just some because this happened before when I was in the military. And it was very interesting that personal development, when I was left to myself, when I didn't have the weight of the world on me, good things happen. Uh, that's one of the things I could say about my life, that. I have the ability to meet people and people will instantly like me in real life. And that, that has just been a lifelong trait where I'm very likable and people just take to me and people uh, look out for me. So that's something that's still part of it. And that's one of the things that helped me battle living in the hood because they knew that I didn't belong there and they treated me as like such. They just knew it. But, yeah, there were many lessons learned in the Decatur house, and I wasn't there that long. I was there maybe six months, moved back to the West End house, and moved to East Point. And I still had some action going on, because I still had the Spellman chick, Lori, and Prince George, you know, because I would go to their place and hook up. Because they just were, you know, they, they were like, Laura's just like, I, I, that house is creepy. And it, the house did look a little scary. I mean, it, it was a huge house that Anthony had converted into a boarding house. But she wouldn't step foot in there. And I'm like, you bust, you breaking me off all this nice trim. I'm not going to argue with you. But I do remember that how they find these places, because see, there was a, I'll do this story uh, next when I moved to the East Point boarding house. And then I moved into the East Point house because 
how that worked out was very intriguing because the East Point house was kind of like the Decatur house. More upscale people, the guy who owned it lived in the boarding house. He got himself together. He bought that house for $25,000 and he was renting out six rooms for 150 bucks a week. And about a year and a half, that house was, was a cash cow. He got back all his money, plus he was rolling in profit. And I met him when he owned that. I think he was in his third year of ownership of the house, and he would come through in his Jag. And I met this whole assortment of people that, the, the hidden people, you, folks you don't really see if you're well-to-do because they're, they just don't intersect with you. You might see a homeless person. That's as close as you get to it. You don't actually see these people. Uh, people who work really hard, but they just don't make enough money to live the way they want to. It was very interesting, you know, as I look back from where I am now, and I look way back to that, because the other day I went to have some blood work, and I went to a company I used to work for, and I didn't have the affinity. I, I was like, I have nothing in common with these people. And that was part of the, the transition that was part of the arc because you can't keep the same dysfunctional, poverty-driven environment and expect to rise. So I had to shed all of that stuff and I, I got rid of it and I got rid of a lot of the attitudes and I essentially reinvented myself because one of the things I would do when I moved out of the house at East Point, the East Point boarding house, because I met this woman on blackplanet.com. Her name was Diane. And she was just like, well, you living over there. Why don't you rent my house? Because Diane was getting into real estate investment and she had bought a second house. And she was just like, hey, she charged me a thousand bucks for a house that I rented out the top to my boy, Don. And um, it was a nice place. That was where the rent -a crate I remember, because I had did Scheme Incorporated in the West End house, but I got the job offer for rent -a crate when I was sitting on the floor of the East Point house, and I had to go down the street on Cleveland Avenue and get on the phone and talk like Mr. Patel. Yes, he worked here. Yes, I will hire him again. Two questions. That's all he asked me. And that was the path of many years of uninterrupted personal and social escalation. Year after year, it got better and better and better. I met better people. I made better networks. And I started off in that little cold room with no heat and no air, wondering what was going to happen next. Pretty interesting. You know, life is a very interesting journey depending on how hard you're willing to work because there was a ton of hard work. There was a ton of introspection. There was a ton of setting myself up for the future. And that's when I tell you guys, you got to get busy. You got to work. You got to take action. I'm not speaking out of my butt. I'm speaking from experience because action is what took me from living in a boarding house to getting a job that I made enough money to buy a brand new BMW cash money in roughly about 24 months. That happened in 24 months. So the, the great transformation is massive action. I was always studying. I had Earl Nightingale lead the field. I had uh, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. I recommend you get that book and you turn that book as a gospel. That's one of the reasons that I get onto the hoteps because they're trying to move forward while they got the brakes on and they don't understand. They have the mental brakes on and they're trying to move forward and it's just not going to work. Your subconscious mind is not going to allow you to escalate, experience personal success as long as you keep thinking that way. And that's one of the things I got rid of. And this is one of the things that 
when I got in the business world, I forgot I was black. I didn't go in there, quote, as a black man. I went in there as a man. And that's a very important thing to realize that I took off my blackness and I refused to let anyone remind me that I was black because I had some people along the way, Marilyn, the racist, the, you know, Jim was an owner. And I was like, you know, I refuse to accept this. I'm going to keep operating because I was operating as a man competing with other men and I was winning. Essentially, I made a choice to operate as an intelligent man, not as an intelligent black man. And that made all the difference in the world because when you go in black, you haul in 450 years of baggage with you. It's hard to rise when you got 450 years of baggage holding you down. It's hard to move to the next level. It is very, very hard. And this isn't about forgetting who, where you come from and forgetting the bad things that's happening. It's that you're not operating in that environment because it is really hard. And, you know, there's a study. Frequently, the, the men, the children of upper class or rich parents often end up poor in adult life. And I, I have a, some theories on why that happens, because they're dragging all that baggage into everything they do. And that baggage ain't going to fit in certain rooms. It's just not. Well, that's all I got for you guys. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe, hit the bell, and I will talk to you later. And once again, below I have a lot of things that will help you out so you can avoid the boarding house. So you can avoid that. Trust me on that. They'll help you.